Okay, so we are now back. Let's give some final thoughts for Disgaea 1. Uh, I guess to set a premise for this, I've played the game before. So we decided to do kind of a challenge run where we chose not to grind or have extremely limited access to things. And I think it's to prove a point where I think this game gets a bad rap, where everybody calls it like a grinder's game. And uh, yeah, our entire playthrough with basically no cutscene skips at all, uh, unfortunately due to the fact that the PC version does not allow that in the first place, uh, that took under 40 hours. So, and that included beating uh, the uber boss of the game. So, I, I guess I'll shrug. I guess we showed that we barely had to grind for the bonus content. But I guess it just depends on comfortability with the game. So what kind of game did it turn out to be? Well, I think we had fun with some of the turn-based mechanics. We uh, got to see the standpoint of uh, the protagonist, Laharl, go around and basically chuck people around to position on the board in a turn-based fashion. We dealt with uh, basically colored tiles that would have different effects depending on what other prisms were sitting on said matching color tiles. So if we saw a prism that gave 50% attack on a blue tile, all blue tiles did that. And we sort of played around with the puzzle mechanic where destroying one prism turns the tiles one color or potentially negates them. But honestly, in the main playthrough itself, it doesn't come up, like, too crazy often outside of, like, ultra gimmicky stages. Um, a majority of them don't even have that, which is a little sad, but it is what it is. I would say overall, you know, comparing this since I played the PS2 version, I'm aware of the Disgaea 1 Complete version. I will say it's a little harder to recommend the PC version. It's definitely a step up over the PS2 version where there's just some qual some quality of life fixes for basic animation skips. But I think Disgaea 1 Complete goes the full distance. So if you were interested in the game or you were interested in uh, the playthrough itself and wanted to try on your own, I would really recommend to check out the Complete version, which is available on console versions since that allows for full skipping of cutscenes for the most part and much faster animation cancels. So just overall, respect your time a little more. And I think it's just kind of a byproduct of this game being, you know, it came out on PS2, it came out on PSP, then they released it on Steam, which is the version we played, and then they did a, a console re-release on things like Switch and PS4, etc. So from that standpoint, we played kind of like one of the up-the-path kind of things. We got to see bonus content compared to the original game. Um, but overall, from a turn-based standpoint, it mostly holds up. I would say, you know, from the from the standpoint of the story mode, I think we had a, lot, a decent amount of fun creating some characters and kind of seeing what we could do with them and, in theory, unlock other character classes. But uh, I guess this will be a light mechanic spoiler, but not like a story spoiler. Monsters are kind of broken in this game. Like, they are just really, really, really hilariously overpowered. Um, it's not an exaggeration to say that in the story itself, we ended it like, I don't know, like low 80s, and then we did the bonus story after that, which I won't go into detail, uh, where it's basically like a what-if scenario, and we ended that around 110-ish, 120, without any additional grinding, which was a little difficult, I'm not gonna lie, the bonus content did not feel as properly scaled as the main story, so that kind of sucked. I did feel like there were a couple of maps that were really, really unfair to the point where there was a, a, a mix of like AI manipulation since AI could technically go in a random order when they move all their units and a little bit of uh, strategy. So some of those things felt satisfying to do. I would say the main story mostly holds up uh, going through it. I would say I will hold off on spoilers for the story, but there's a couple points I want to talk about on regards to that. But otherwise, I think for the most part, it's like passable. I would say the Steam version is passable. I'd still recommend the complete one would be the short summary. If you have an itch to play like a game where potentially you could spend hundreds of hours in it, if you want to, this game has the potential to do it. There are a lot of endings. There are a lot of things to unlock. There's a lot of cameo fights. There's a lot of bonus areas. There's the ability to dive into items to slowly improve them. There's like a lot of ways you can spend your time on the game. So for people that are looking for something that will, you know, can be short short and story based, it's possible. We completed, I think, the main story in a little under 30 hours. Might have been like 28 with all cutscenes playing. 
Um, but again, that assumes comfortability with the game. And I think from the standpoint of casual play, I mean, there's like a million ways you can grind as well. I think one thing that I'm a little mixed on would be the assembly. And I think it just has to do with the animation and or time it takes to pass spills. So for example, your character starts out at rank zero. You can take promotion exams to slowly get more things unlocked in the Senate. The Senate will start adding options like stronger enemy bill or stronger enemies, uh, triple XP, some gimmicky things uh, like Prinny Day, where only Prinnies could be in the next map. There's other things in there too to unlock all the bonus areas. So if you want to spend extra time doing that, you're able to do so. I would say a big mechanic of it that I think is a little unfortunate that they lock it into rank 3 and it's not a default behavior, which I think is kind of a misstep in Disgaea 1 in particular, uh, was the ability to transmigrate. So the whole point of it is you kind of take your main character, you potentially have create characters under them, so you create like a master-student relationship or master-pupil, it depends on what version of the game you're playing. And essentially, the student slash pupil stats get added to the masters. So if you have a warrior under them and a mage, you take the mage's highest, because they're highest in, and you might take the warrior's highest strength and combine them into the master to make like an overall better character. So the game kind of frames itself like that when you go to play it, and or the ability to take a character from like a rank one soldier up to rank five. So you might see some increases in your aptitude, so you get more impacted by equipment stats or you might get better base stats and the more you transmigrate the more levels you have stored up and the better quality of transmigration you use the more bonus stats you get in general so technically there's a way that it, it kind of like snowballs where you start getting points but i'm gonna be honest with you chat disgaea one is a very broken game we saw what happened when we started monster combining uh when the challenge was over and oh boy is there like no reason to do <laughs> like a third if not 40% of the mechanics I just mentioned. I mean, like, why transmigrate multiple times when you can just stack monsters together enough times by throwing them into each other to combine levels and then throw them into your base and now you have super monsters? It kind of invalidates the whole game. So I'm not going to lie, this game has a lot of problems. So it really just depends on, I guess, your viewability of the game, whether that kind of stuff is okay. I mean, it's to the point where, like... You can literally have an item that adds 200 attack as an accessory, as one of your three accessory slots on any character. You could apply it on a human character, get 200 points. It's like, okay, I don't have a multiplier, just what it is. You put it on a monster, you get like literally 10 to 20 times the amount. It's like insanely stupid how overpowered they are, especially at high levels, which is not hard to do when you combine monsters together. So I would say your experience really varies with this game, whether you want to have like a tight knit party of people that you name and you control their classes, which are like more traditional roles like clerics for healing or like red, green and blue mages to cover the different elements of the game and maybe upgrade them to star mages and stuff like that. There's kind of like the traditional RPG in there that reminds me a little bit of things like, I don't want to say Final Fantasy Tactics, but it reminds me of other turn based games uh, where we have a very heavy class system and a very simple triple element system of fire, ice, and wind, where basically one enemy will usually be strong against something and weak against another, and you can kind of see those things, so they're not really a surprise to you. And I think for the most part, that portion of the game holds up well, but I would say definitely uh, buyer beware with the bonus content. It either requires quite a bit of grinding and or mixing of items, or you just use monsters and negate the whole challenge, so... Endgame content is not particularly balanced, and I guess it kind of makes sense where the story mode can be played through start to finish without doing that much more other than like maybe a couple of promotion exams to make sure you can transmigrate early. Um, and I felt like the balance was definitely very tight with the main story itself and questionable, which we'll go into details in a moment on the bonus story. Uh, but I think overall I still ended up having fun with the game. I will say it does detract from the point of the series, which they definitely honed in on in the later games, where damage formulas are a little weird, class abilities are a little weird, like for example Ninja's still sadly bugged in the PC version, so he can auto dodge ally skills, which is really stupid, I don't know why they didn't fix it in the PC version, it's definitely, it was definitely something they could have done. And actually one more thing I'll say before we go into spoilers. 
The music is the music is fine, but I will say the graphics. This game required a lot of uh, additional patches to get running. I don't think I talked about this in the play in the playthrough itself. But basically, I had a lot of problems getting the game to run on the PC version at first. Like, I kept getting all, like, black boxes where characters should be, or dialogue wasn't appearing where it should, or, like, other weird glitches. So I would recommend that if you do end up taking the PC version, I would highly recommend you look for the mods that fix these kinds of things, since it just seems like the game is old enough and it's not really compatible with graphics cards and i don't want to hear that it's like oh i don't have the latest graphics card i'm like no i've literally literally one of the most recent graphics cards available like it's definitely not that kind of problem i don't know if they just don't have like good testing for like amd graphics cards or what the deal is and i'm definitely not going to downgrade a, a graphics card version to go play this game so just beware it does require a bit of touch up if you want to get the steam version which is why i do recommend the complete version over that so just want to state that in the final thoughts, because I don't want to just say like, oh, you know, he played, he had no issues. No, 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 there were, there were a lot of issues getting it to run. Uh, so let's talk about spoilers. Um, the playthrough of playing as uh, Prince Laharl, Etna, Juan, the, the angel that potentially becomes the fallen angel, or just straight up dead, I guess, depending on what ending you do. Um... I think for the most part, it's still fine. Like, I don't think all of the humor lands. The humor is, like, okay. I think it's kind of interesting in the sense that it, it just ends up being very wacky. So sometimes you're kind of curious what's next. I like some of the cameo villains a lot more. And I, I can see why they become iconic in the later series. Like, there's kind of characters that are introduced and then they just kind of drop off, which is a problem with a lot of the villains. Yeah, like... A Prism Ranger. The Prism Rangers were nice, for example. Those were villains that were nice. Or, to some extent, I guess Curtis was kind of a more interesting villain in the series compared to, like, the military general when Earth goes to invade the Netherworld. And things like that. Like, there are some, like, more memorable characters. Some of them are, like, extremely one-note. Like, Volcanus does like... Volcanus is Volcanus. He's very boring as an angel, to be honest. So there, there's some that are, as this before, it's kind of hit or miss. Yeah, it can be a little pervy at times, which is a bit unfortunate. That's the stuff that doesn't hold up as much. Um, because the, the, the protagonist has basically an aversion to hot women, <laughs> according to the game. So I guess it's kind of like a play on the trope, I guess. But it's still kind of awkward sitting through that dialogue. You have to, you have to tell what it is. I think from the standpoint of story, it was... Kind of interesting to see them play upon a what-if scenario with the bonus story where basically instead of playing as Laharl and trying to get together uh, a ragtag crew of demons to declare yourself overlord after your father dies and interacting with all the strange things that are happening as you attempt to do so, it plays off of a scenario where basically your second in command, instead of waking you up, accidentally kills you or believes they have killed you. So I kind of like that a little bit because they, they do a callback to Disgaea 1 with some of their throwaway lines, like the space detective stuff. So I thought it was kind of nice for what it was. Like, I wasn't expecting anything too in-depth. I do think Etna is probably one of the more interesting slash better characters in the cast. So if they were going to do another mode that revolved around somebody else, I would definitely prefer that over somebody like Flan, for example. Um... Uh, but I think overall, uh, there are some big balance issues in Etna mode. And you can kind of tell, like, the core game had a difficulty curve where it went up maybe, like, five or, like, ten levels most uh, between most of the stages, if even that, uh, for a long time. And only maybe the last couple of stages are semi-difficult. Whereas Etna mode, the enemy scaling is, like, out of control. I think we saw at one point we started, I think at like what, level 60 or eight, six, somewhere between 60 and 80. And then they ended up at like almost 500. That made no sense. <laughs> Your levels in this game are very slow unless you do certain things. So it's like not hard to get back up to level 40 due to how the XP works, but it is extremely difficult to go from like 100 to 101 or 100 to 102. Like the amount of more or less exponential XP between levels 1 and 100 is really sharp. So, Etna mode ended up being very difficult 
because I feel like they didn't really test it. Like, honestly, like I came in prepared with a strong set of characters using strategies like Braveheart to raise our attack power. We were doing a uh, mechanic known as diagonal throws, which is eventually made into a real mechanic in the later Disgaea, so they just left it in the early ones, where if you flick between two directions really quickly, you could throw in between in order to get past some obstacles. Even with all that, even with lifting things to make sure enemies waste their turn and basically kill your character by being lifted by them, even with all that, Etna Mode had at least two maps that were just way too difficult to the point where we were literally trying to figure out the exact order of enemies moving. We're trying to figure out the perfect setup of having all the hospital goods unlocked, which I forgot to talk about in the other portion, but whatever. But it, from that standpoint of just having all those items to just barely be able to have a chance to beat like the final stage of Edna Mode, that, I just feel like the final stage in particular was just way overtuned. They were probably not have been a, as bad if the enemy didn't just randomly have like level 16 spells and could hit like nine or 10 tiles away. Like there's not really a lot of counterplay to that. You either just live that or die. There's nothing in between. They start further than you could ever hope to hit and there's no way you would be able to survive most, like, multiple turns against them. Unless they were ultra, ultra tanky. So, kind of unfortunate. So, I would say from the standpoint, I like from the first playthrough perspective, they give you items based off of HP, uh, the equivalency of magic points is SP in this game, and number of characters killed, will result in more items. So, even if the stages themselves are kind of underwhelming uh, in terms of rewards, as part of a bonus, at least those are kind of guaranteed items in any kind of playthrough, so it helps with the replayability. But I will say in Etna mode, it was a big mistake to make the stage rewards as bad as they were. There is no reason that Etna mode should start with items. In, in terms of difficulty, it's like two or three stages before the final stage of the campaign, and it scaled way higher than that across like two stages. I don't know why they decided to make the items so bad in Etna mode. I feel like that makes it really hard, but not in a fun way. Like, for example, I ended the story mode with like a 600 to 700 attack weapon, depending on the extra uh, specialists that were on the weapon, which is just kind of like a random modifier to determine how many stats they have. Technically, out in world, you could use it to increase your stats, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, not an important mechanic if you could go to play the game, to be honest with you. But from that standpoint, it was very disappointing to then have this 600-700 weapon, which we end the story mode with, and then we go to Etna mode, and it gives you a weapon with, like, 80 attack. I'm like, listen, it's literally useless. There's nothing you can do with this weapon. It is, like, hilariously terrible. <laughs> Just, like, it, it has, like, a tenth of the value of something that is barely strong enough to clear some of these areas. I don't know what they were thinking with it. So, yeah, definitely misplay. It ended up making it more difficult because uh, one thing that also affects is basically every stage has a bonus rank. So instead of basically potentially deciding if you want to do a lot of combos in order to build up the bonus gauge or perhaps destroy the prisms, so that way every time you convert a tile to another color, it adds one out of 100 towards another level of items and you could decide how many items you want to go for. Most of the items were just terrible in Etna mode. I think even at the final part, like we got to the final stage of the game, we got an item called the Dark Rosary from the final stage of the game. That item has not been had not been relevant at that point in our playthrough for like 18 hours. That's a and and considering that was from a pure plot standpoint and it took us 28 hours or so to beat the game, that is really bad. I don't know why they did it. It was like actually funny how terrible it was. Like there's there is no scenario in which that ever would have helped me at the point I was in the game. If I could defeat a level 500 enemy, I'm not going to be using something I had at level 30. I'm sorry. It just It's just not relevant anymore in this game. I'm sorry. So regardless of the game trying to scale things to potentially as high as 9,999, uh, there were definitely some misplays with some of the balancing. And I think most of it comes from the bonus content of the PSP thing. I will say the cameo fights... Uh, did make the game significantly easier to clear because a lot of those characters had really strong items. 
And I kind of mentioned this before in the non-spoiler section, but man, oh man, is there just like no point to leveling human characters outside of story mode. Like, human characters might be the fastest option to clear story mode because it takes a little bit of time to monster level. But when it comes to the bonus content, like, why would I ever raise a human character if I'm just going to get a weapon that essentially adds 400,000 to a monster's attack power by just playing the stage? Like, why even bother at that point? It's it's a number so large and so hard to fathom that it just, it by having it, it completely breaks the game. So it's like, if I know those things are coming, why would I play human characters? So aside from using them for Braveheart and occasionally magic boost if I feel like having them snipe things, uh, the game's late game falls apart really hard. Again, I don't know if they were assuming you would spend hundreds of hours to maybe build up a weapon to give you 20,000 to a human character after, like, meticulous management of, you know, here's all my specialists that add attack, now let's move them to another weapon so that way we can optimize that, so we can optimize this. Or you just play monsters and just break the game. So, I'll be honest with you, Disgaea is never going to be a series where things are balanced, but it is it is extremely notable in Disgaea 1, the, the stat disparity. Like, the fact that a 200 attack item could be, like, 2,000 or 3,000 on one character and 200 on the other. It's like, why, why even bother at that point, chat, honestly? I think I see what they were trying to go for, but with the idea that, like, the more you attack with weapons, you build up a proficiency, which gives you, like, 5% in stats, which then unlocks skills, and the skills give you good AoEs, and they have damage multipliers. Or monsters don't do any of that and automatically unlock that at being a higher level and they scale better. I just, I don't know. Maybe at like the extreme upper bounds in which the game difficulty no longer matters. Maybe humans will eventually survive the difficulty curve. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe they'll eventually become gods here if they have all maxed out items. But honestly, to beat the game, you don't really need to do that. I think we went through in our playthrough in the item world twice. I think that's it, right, chat? We went through the item world twice. We went for the story mode, because it was required, and we basically just kept that item and didn't use it. It was irrelevant. I think we put on, like, a common orb or something like that. And then the final time was just to snatch a couple items to give us better attack power before we could get to the bonus content. And honestly, even then, I don't even know if the second time was necessary to get things like Lucifer Force in our playthrough. I mean, it helped, but, like... Given how OP some of the other weapons are, I don't know if it was 100% worth it. I mean, I guess it was okay. At least the weapons we picked up we used for a couple hours. So it's not like it just immediately got obsoleted, but I don't know how much of that was actually required to beat the game. Uh, in terms of bonus content, we had already beaten the game at that point. Uh, but I think from the standpoint of the game itself, I definitely look forward to doing more of the series. I will say... Uh, I'm a little disappointed the cameos, for the most part in this one, that did involve games in the later series weren't really voice acted, which was kind of a shame, including the characters you can recruit. So that's a little awkward for people that played, like, Disgaea 2 or, like, um, the Kai Kingdom to just have, like, very memorable voice actors just not voice anything. It's kind of unfortunate. Yeah, it's one thing... It's one thing if it's, like during the story mode they don't have dialogue but even like their attacks are quiet so even even just them attacking doesn't have a sound effect for the most part they feel a little incomplete i guess as it were but yeah i think for the most part uh bu -bu 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 -bu. yeah cameo characters definitely break the game it's not necessarily that their stats are too crazy in fact i think there's only like one or two characters total out of the many cameos that were, like, actually decent. Um, but I think it's more the items they come with. Like, the items that they can wield, and given that, like, 90% of them are monsters, uh, it just so heavily favors monster characters, there's nothing you can really do. I, I hope that if we, when we go to play the later Disgaea games, and we fight cameo characters, that they give us more human characters to fight. Because, like, where where was the upgrade for any of our warrior characters, right, chat? We did, like, the Demon Hall mirror. We got, like, the best weapon in the game, which was, like, 4,000 attack. And then we immediately got, like, seven monster weapons that were better than it. Like, we got all the Nemesis, the Nemesis Mach 2s, 
we had uh like diaco's claw we got like i don't know like there were so many other weapons that we got in that scale all back to back that were equal to if not better in stats than the strongest human weapon we found in the game like a 4k axe or whatever and due to the way monster scales as i said before a 4k axe on a human is 4k attack you know it's pretty straightforward maybe it'll be a bit more based off of you know their proficiency in the weapon they get five percent more stats yada yada but like the same monster character was getting like a hundred thousand plus so it's like unless my mastery of the weapon was going into the, the triple digits level which is not i think feasible uh in normal game hour time uh yeah monsters were just completely the right choice start to finish throughout the game which is a bit unfortunate so hopefully we'll see some fixes and in fact i know there are some fixes between disgaea 1 and disgaea 2 uh, where some of the class abilities are better balanced. Um, one big issue in this game, especially compared to the other ones, is that aptitude is kind of just bad on human characters. Like, for example, like our warrior at max rank, which is like one of the starting classes, or even our brawler uh, ranked up, who's just a fist fighter with a lot of counters, he never, they never really get like a good attack multiplier. I think at the most part, like warrior as a cosmic hero, for example, just has a hundred percent attack aptitude where like we'll go to you'll go to see it in the later disgaea games some of those base classes start at 110 and scale to like 130. so like it just felt kind of unsatisfying to transmigrate on some of the classes just because like the stat differences were very minute most of it was just like i got slightly better movement or maybe slightly better jump score to deal with height on like a 2d map kind of style thing so I, I do feel like that mechanic was, it, it was definitely, I would say, I'm not going to say revolutionary, but I think it defined the series. I just feel like in these many re-releases of the game, having played the original, having played the now the PC port, and having witnessed at least some of the complete version, I do feel like it was a misstep to, uh, to leave the aptitudes the way they were, because there were just clearly some characters that were just infinitely better than some of the other choices, and some of that just has to do with uh, again, aptitudes and the way monsters scale. So hopefully as we go through the series, we'll see them kind of retweak the formulas, like how guns work will change over the series, how bows work, which we didn't use at all in the playthrough, by the way. <laughs> yeah, actually, I don't think, yeah, I don't think we used the bow a single time the entire playthrough. It was just pointless. There's no point. Um, I do think it's a little unfortunate going back to the PC version, uh, where basically healing abilities and buffs don't count as XP builders for your characters. Like, you'll build up weapon proficiency, and staff users are technically really good because they could get more range and area attacks and interesting patterns they could do with their spells uh, the more you use them, which I think is a good mechanic. Um, but unfortunately, it's kind of marred by the fact that most of the stuff just doesn't scale that well, unfortunately. And that has to do with the base class being kind of bad. Mage is getting somewhere close to like 110% on the final mage form is kind of sad. We didn't talk about it in the playthrough. Well, we talked about it a little bit in the playthrough, but there's also like an ultimate class you can unlock that invalidates every other character. So I think even if you were to not if you were to not compare it against later entries in this series, it still is kind of disappointing in its own universe where you unlock a Majin by having, like, level 200 of certain classes, of human classes, and they have an S rank at everything, and 120% in everything, and they have super movement, and they have good throw, and they have good jump. So, basically, every character just becomes one class in the end by the time you unlock it. So, honestly, I had a lot more fun without unlocking the classes, which is kind of funny, because I think most people do try to get all the classes, or, you know, experiment, like, oh, like, I got another cleric, or whatever, and I'm like, I don't need healing spells. <laughs> Right, Chad? I'm like, nah, I don't need any clerics. <laughs> well, I mean, like, what what did we have? Like, two healers total, and both of them were uh, just forced heal care. Oh, technically, I think we had three at the end of the game. Uh, because we, we never bothered learning healing spells. It's just if the character came with the healing spell, that's what we had. So I think it was kind of interesting in hindsight doing the challenge, the low-level challenge, where item usage to heal was actually relevant. Because I have to say, when I when you play in a more casual sense, it's very rare that healing is relevant. But when you're in those kind of early story stages, being able to buy an item that heals 4,500 health, which is basically 100% heal, and turn any character you want into a healer is pretty strong. I do think that completely invalidated healers. 
I'm not gonna lie. That alone just makes them completely pointless. So it's a bit unfortunate. Like I could AOE heal for like a mediocre amount when I can invest a lot of money into said cleric or I could just throw a healing item and then not have a mediocre character <laughs> try to heal people. <laughs> Do you know what I mean, chat? It just, it's just kind of an unfortunate byproduct of the system. So hey, we'll see if they uh, improve it across the next couple of games. I have played most of the other ones in the series, or at least up to, I think, four or five. So I played at least a handful of them. We'll put it that way. Maybe maybe not most anymore, since they released a couple of new ones. Um, but I think from the standpoint of gameplay, yeah, I, as I said before, I do like some of the touches the PC had to skip animations, but... Overall, eh, it was okay. I, I liked it for the story, but I think just due to the way that you can't skip certain things, I personally do not really want to loop through the story, which I think is a shame. Because it, it definitely is meant to be one of those games you play for all eternity if you want to, just to see like what power height you can hit. But yeah, I, I think I'll say no, chat. I think I'll say no to uh, more of that. But hey, we went through at least one new game cycle just so we could do the bonus story. So we'll count that. But anyway, chat, I don't think I have anything else to say. If you want to add anything, you could provide your final thoughts. I will say from the standpoint of... We talked about some characters. I don't really have anything to say about them there. Oh, show us the pig. There we go. <laughs> I'm gonna say, Chad has found their new favorite character for sure. So I would say the art direction is also fine. I know Disgaea 1 Complete basically replaces them with HD models. PC is more of the pixels, so it looks more like how the PS2 version would have looked. Whereas, like, they have more of kind of like the very different art style with Complete, which sometimes bothers people. I figured I'd mention it, but I, I do think the Complete version is just a little better in general. Oh, I guess that we didn't talk about that. There are a lot of other memorable characters, like the Prinnies are definitely the best part of the game by far, where they just say do to do all sorts of stupid stuff in it. I think they knew it and pushed it a bit more, but I also like from the standpoint that, you know, they did try having a whole bunch of things to see what would stick. And I think for the most part, when they experimented with uh, some of the cameo fights, or no, not cameo, sorry, cameo is the wrong word, with some of kind of like the episodic fights, that's more what I meant to say. Uh, I think most of the villains in that case were decent. Yeah. So it, it's just, it's kind of interesting. We'll we'll see how Chad feels as we go through the series. Laharl's kind of bratty, so it's kind of hard to be on his side, per se. So, I, I think he's a very memorable character. I don't know if he's, like, super likable, which is the best way to put it. Like, he's, he, he's a character you kind of tolerate in the story. He gets a little better over time, and that's supposed to be his character growth, but uh, yeah, he's, he's something else for sure. And again, some it's take it or leave it. Some people find it funny, some don't. But anyway, chat, I don't think I have anything else to say for the final thoughts. Um, except for the fact that I do think some endings are just kind of really short. I do like the fact that if you do lose to uh, mid-boss or Dark Adonis early on, it teaches you the concept of New Game Plus. So I think for new players that aren't comfortable with, like, enemy stacking to get more mana or to, like, exploit the fact that, you know, two level 20s combined into a level 40 is worth way more XP than those two level 20s alone due to how the XP scales from 1 to 100. If you're not familiar with some of the nuance of the game, which is not really explored in any detail, like, you just have to kind of find it for yourself or explore online. I did find it amusing that that mid-boss, literally mid-boss, uh, will put you in a new game plus cycle to teach you that it's okay to start over from the beginning. But I will state in general, I'm really hoping when we pick up another Disgaea that they let you skip the cutscenes. Like, listen, I don't mind the ability to watch the cutscenes, but man oh man, chat, sitting through like two, three minutes of them introducing a chapter every single time is really painful. So for me, that did not age well at all. And again, that has some more, that more comes from like the PS2 era and mindset where those things weren't expected. Like, I think the base game didn't have any animation skips at all, for example. That was something added in later releases. So it's a bit unfortunate. And actually, one more thing I lied. There's one more thing I want to talk about. 
I wish this game made it a bit more clear it was using PSP controls and not another kind of formula, because there are a lot of PSP commands that the game doesn't explain to you, and unless you have a PSP manual or look it up, you don't know they exist. Like, if you hit, like, square and R1 or square and L1, you get a completely different set of actions. That I find a bit weird. I'm, I'm not sure why that's not in a way that you can access it in the game. I guess it makes more sense if you play a PSP. I don't own a PSP, so not in like a million years would I think that that is a button combination <laughs> that does anything. I'm like, what is this? I don't understand. I'm, I'm playing a game on Steam. I don't assume PSP controls. I'm sorry. I'm just like, I'm so confused. So it is what it is, I guess, with that. But anyway, chat, that is the final thoughts. So I guess thank you for watching and I guess see you again next time as we will probably pick up Disgaea in a future Halloween session.